So good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to what I believe will be the most interesting and the most exciting panel uh, of the conference so far. I don't know if we've got a lot to trump, and uh, I also know that there'll be uh, a real struggle between uh, bed after the uh, good party that we had yesterday, and thanks for the organisers for, for hosting that party. But I think the coming and, and being here and sitting here will be your worthwhile. Uh, my name is Billa Brulman Wengerfeld and I'm from the University of Tartu, so I represent a local academic perspective. And uh, I'm very, very excited to be able to uh, present to you uh, a keynote speaker uh, who has definitely inspired my own work in its early uh, stages and uh, who has made me look differently at many of the is issues and aspects of both e-governance and uh, uh, politics online uh, as large. So uh, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, Pippa Norris uh, to you who is uh, McCoy Lecturer uh, in Comparative Politics at uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government in Harvard University. And her work in uh, the form of many books and very inspiring articles has uh, looked at the public opinion and elections and democratic institutions and try to open it up from the culture, gender and politics perspective to, to, to make it be more to, to display the variety and diversity. And as appropriate to academic perspective, she will be uh, questioning some of those headlines and some of those uh, uh, what, what would apparently look like uh, self-evident things. But she will be questioning and ho opening up to us a little bit about the the public and the role of Arab Spring and the question of whether Facebook has anything to do with it. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to uh, Pippa Norris and uh, to what I hope will be a very interesting academic lecture. Thank you, Pilar. And thanks very much to the organizers and to Ivor Tallow for the <coughs> invitation to come and to interact with you today. I was going to talk about another different type of issues, but I thought that really the issue in the headline right now, which is so fascinating for everybody interested in ICTs and in governance, are the challenges in the Arab Spring. Of course, the Arab Spring itself is turning into an Arab summer and now an Arab fall. But nevertheless, there's a tremendous amount of speculation, in particular about whether social media have played a critical role in all of the changes that we've been seeing in the region, whether it's Tunisia, whether it's issues of Egypt, whether it's Libya, or any of the other countries currently under challenge. And I thought, therefore, thinking about this issue would be really important for the conference, because governance is not simply a top-down process of how established states inform their citizens and interact with their citizens. It's also about the basic capacity of the state when challenged to respond, and therefore how far there's also issues of upward um, change and how far there can be roles for the public. So first what I thought I'd do is set out some theoretical framework and it's a theoretical framework derived from some of my uh, most recent book, in particular Democratic Deficits, and think about whether or not the social media have had a distinctive impact on protest activism in the region or whether there are multiple determinants. It might well be that although there's a, a tremendous discussion about the social media, that this is exaggerated, it's journalists talking to journalists, which we know does happen, and therefore the role is really much less important than has been attributed. Then I'm going to look at a bit of regional evidence, and in particular we can look at who has been online, who's been using Facebook and Twitter in the region, and what's the penetration of social media. And I'm going to argue that despite the amount of discussion, access is often quite limited, and therefore even though it might activate the active, there has to be other forms of communication in, in order to mobilize the mass public. And of course, the evidence that we have from the region itself is quite limited. Obviously, developments are still in process. But we can also locate these changes in a broader set of evidence. And I'm going to draw on the World Values Survey, which is the biggest survey worldwide, covering now 90 countries. 
I'm going to use the fifth wave, where we can look at those who use a variety of different types of media, the internet, television and radio, newspapers, contrast their profile, and then see whether or not there's a general impact of the internet, usually on what I term democratic deficits, the gap between aspirations and satisfaction with how democracy works. And then some general conclusions, and I really welcome all the panel to think about some of these issues with me. This is work in progress, it's news in progress, but I think it's important issues for us to consider. So what's the theory? What are the arguments? Well, obviously, this is the context. And so we start with Tunisia in January and the dramatic events there, which it has to be said nobody was predicting. Not the international observers, not the scholars, and probably not many domestic observers as well. Followed quite quickly afterwards by events unfolding in Egypt, followed, of course, by the uh, outbreak of violence in Libya, a process which is still ongoing, and, of course, the unknown effects of how things continuing to uh, unravel in Syria, with the protests which are being uh, very much repressed by the government, in Yemen, where, again, President Saleh <coughs> went back to his own country uh, after medical treatment, and in Bahrain, where, again, there's some evidence considerable of uh, continuing unrest and continual uh, divisions and repression. So the question which is raised by these events the Arab Spring, is really whether or not the social media do act as a catalyst, as a distinctive role, different to television, different to radio, different to other forms of communication, or whether the impact has really just been exaggerated. So what's the most plausible argument that there is some evidence? In particular, the role of Facebook has been highlighted by a number of commentators. Most of the protest acts, for example, were announced first on Facebook, before they mobilized and demonstrators turned up to a particular area. The role of Twitter as a way of really networking many of the opposition activists and getting people to, to organize and to mobilize in ways they could have done it before through me methods such as mobile telephones or traditional telephones. They could have done it on a one-on-one -on -one personal organization. But Twitter sped the messages, text messaging, mobile phones, <clears throat> the use of video I think has been extremely interesting and the ways in which so many mobile cameras now can capture particular moments of violence on the streets and instantly um, let everybody know about that through uploading. The use of microblogs, internet, crowd mapping. Crowd mapping, I think, is a, another interesting phenomenon which I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate in just a minute. And it's argued the social media have had a particular impact in the, in the Arab Spring, in part because of the youthful population. We know there's a tremendous youth bulge in the region, and this is the group who's most likely to adapt to these um, forms of communication. And it's argued there's two roles. One is through interactive mobilization. Anybody can announce an event. Anybody can, can call for people to turn up to a particular day, a particular time. Anybody can uh, 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 take a particular picture or a video that then gets uh, broadcast very broadly. And also, there's a double effect, a secondary effect, through the information which then gets reproduced through the traditional media, and that includes the international media, BBC, CNN, and all the other channels like that, as well as through uh, personal networks. So it seems quite plausible that if we think about the Arab Spring, compared with, for example, the revolutions and the regime transitions which occurred in this region um, decades ago, that there's a stronger role for social media and that social media really has played a distinctive uh, position. Well, let's think about this a little bit more theoretically and let's think about the ways in which we could think about protest activism more generally. And this is derived from my book, Democratic Deficits, that came out in Cambridge University Press this year. And I'd like to suggest that if we think of it this way, First, what we have to have is more than simply the media. First, what we have to have is rising public aspirations for human rights, for freedoms, for democratic opportunities, and a growing <coughs> cognitive skills, ability to use the media, ability to, to criticize and to think through, and evolving self-expression values, a demand for freedom. And I think, again, in the Arab Spring, there's considerable evidence that there are strong demands that the regime should be liberalized and there should be an opening up of human rights. But that will be the first part of what's needed. Then you also need the role of social media <clears throat> to provide both critical coverage and commentary on the role of the state 
as well as ways to network and to organize and to bring people together. But you also need, in addition <clears throat> to demand, and in addition to the media, a role for supply side. In other words, the role of the state itself has to be seen as failing in particular regards. For example, by failing to provide un uh, uh, jobs and employment for many of the young people who are well educated in the region. By failing to provide uh, economic development or social services, or by failing to stamp out corruption, clientelism and nepotism. When you have that model, then what you end up with is a democratic deficit. And a deficit has often been used in relation to the concept uh, in terms of the European Union, but you can actually use it in any country around the world. And all it really means is that there's a gap between our expectations about what we want and how we actually see uh, democracy working in practice. And it can be found in many countries. It can be found in established democracies, where the public is disillusioned with how democracy is working. It can be found in new democracies, and it can obviously be found in, in authoritarian or autocratic states, where people are very unhappy with the freedoms which exist. And when you have that combination, then the prediction for the theory is that you then have important consequences for protest activism, so people are not just willing to go along, they're not just willing to vote, they're not just willing to be passive, they're much more likely to protest and to be active, whether uh, through violent means or peaceful means. They're less likely to go along with the government and comply with laws, for example, to pay taxes or to, to obey the government in other regards. And ultimately, it's argued, it'll have a pro an impact on the actual society and on the state, because this is what's driving processes of democratization in the region. So it's a model that um, we can look at all the different dimensions. We're not going to do that today, but we are going to look at a little bit of the evidence uh, in terms of some of the gaps and how far in particular the internet is driving the democratic deficit. Now all of that sounds fine, but let's emphasize also that if you're really thinking seriously about the Arab Spring, there are many, many other things which are going to be affecting it. You can't simply say communications or the internet, that's um, very much a, a simplistic perspective. And if you look at the literature on what causes regime transitions, I've got a whole long list. I won't go into them, but these are just on the board. This is what Paul Collier has termed greed and grievance. So obviously, if we're trying to predict which countries are going to have a regime transition and which are not, all sorts of things from the type of regime, patterns of economic conditions, and particularly elite divisions, are going to be absolutely critical for a change. And again, if you think about those countries which have changed in the region, um, Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, they've all gone through very different pathways. And the roles of some of these factors have been very, very distinctive. Social structure is going to be important. <clears throat> the type of divisions uh, in, the la in the country by region, or by language, or by religion, or by tribal identities, geographic location, et cetera, et cetera. So let's not assume that communication is the only driver, but it might be a facilitator. So what's the evidence? And let's look at this in two ways. Firstly, what's the regional evidence that people were using Facebook, that they had access to Twitter, and that they had uh, these sorts of media available to the population as a whole? Well, first, let's just look at the levels of internet access across the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, and what I've done is simply put here the level of liberal democracy measured by Freedom House. I can use many other measures, but they come out fairly similarly. And this is in 2008. And then the levels of internet access uh, as a percentage of the population. And you can immediately see tremendous differences. And some of the countries which have had these uh, radical changes, notably Libya, are very low. Less than 10% of the population, according to the World Development Indicators from the World <coughs> Bank, had access to the internet. Now, what it means, of course, to have access to the internet is somewhat fuzzy nowadays, as we all know. Does it mean watching it a, a bit on your, on your mobile? Does it mean having a laptop or a mainframe? But nevertheless, the estimates are uh, that Libya has very low, and Egypt is pretty low as well. But if we also find some of the other countries, Tunisia was slightly higher, and you can immediately see that the more affluent countries, the more moderate income, Bahrain, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Turkey, have much higher levels of internet access. But of course, internet doesn't necessarily mean that anybody's using it for um, looking at politics, and that anybody's using social media per se. It can be a very passive activity simply to have internet access. 
What about Facebook? Well, here we've got a very good report from the Arab, one called Arab Social Media, which has been developed by the Dubai Department of Government, and they did some uh, analysis of Facebook penetration. And so what they did was they looked at all the countries in the region, and I've just highlighted the ones where we've seen a regime transition, and they looked at the number of Facebook users divided into the population to give us the core estimate of the proportion of people who they think have been using the internet. And the bottom line, quite simply, is A, it varies a lot. So uh, there are some countries, and again, it's the ones with high levels of internet uh, access that we just looked at, as we might expect. So Bahrain, Lebanon, Kuwait, Jordan, Tunisia, have quite high, along with uh, United Arab Emirates. But again, let's think about the Libya context. We showed you that they had very little internet access, and look at the number of users. 71,000, 1% of the population has, has any access to Facebook. Now, it could be true that that 1% are the activists, they are the organizers, they are the ones who are mobilizing other groups. So, as I've argued elsewhere in Digital Divide, essentially, it can be like putting a stone into water where you throw it in and the ripples spread out much more broadly. So people talk to each other about something they've seen on Facebook, or they spread the information to their family and their friends and their colleagues. But, nevertheless, to ex some of the ideas that somehow Libya, Facebook, was driving the Libyan revolution, I mean, let's look at some of these figures and just hold our, have a bit of a breath before we assume that. On the other hand, it's also true that Facebook users has gone up a lot during the Arab Spring. And here, again from the same report, the Arab Social Media Report, they did estimates. And they looked at the pattern of use of Facebook in 2010, before the revolutions and uh, regime transition happened, and then in the period uh, of uh, the Arab Spring. And so you can see the colors here, which are basically uh, the, Arab, uh, the period before is in red, and we can see what happens when the Arab Spring hits. In many countries, internet usage goes up a tremendous amount, and Facebook is used much more widely in the region. So I conclude that Facebook itself doesn't necessarily have wide diffusion, but interest during the, the Arab Spring goes up, and people are using it very much um, to look at particular issues of, uh, uh, of protest, of developments, and politics in the, in the region. What about Twitter? And again, how many times have you heard from journalists, it's a Twitter revolution, that everybody is, is on Twitter? Well, journalists are on Twitter. The population in the region is not necessarily on Twitter. This again shows us the estimates um, of the number of different uh, 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 populations. And you can see the maximum in, is in Qatar with 8%. But it goes right the way down. And you can see all of these countries here have very, very few Twitter users. And this is based on a, a sample of Twitter users attributed by country. And yes, people who are in the region who are looking at Twitter are indeed looking for events about the Arab Spring. But it's a handful of people. It's certainly not a mass population. One of the more interesting uses, which I do think has been evolving in the Arab Spring, is crowd mapping. And a particular, what's most useful about that, is that where there's a particular event, and this gives us an example of it in Syria going on right now, then what crowd mapping allows is for everybody to upload information and to report on particular incidents. As you know, we've been using crowd mapping for a number of natural disasters, where people can work out, for example, in the tsunami in Japan, where the uh, greatest destruction was, where they needed government help. And here what we have is a website which has been using the same sort of phenomena so that people can report on refugees, the number of casualties, the number of those missing eyewitness reports, and so on. Are these reliable numbers? We have to uh, say we're not sure, but what they very much do is help to open up the information. And this is also shown in the voice, uh, VOA Middle East Voices, where again, anybody can upload video. So you've seen a protest, you've seen some sort of uh, imprisonment of an opposition group, you've seen some sort of uh, case of violence in the streets. You can take that from your phone, upload it immediately, and then share it with everybody to really get human rights abuses out and make them much more visible. So what am I concluding about the region? 
that yes, there's a lot of discussion about social media, and yes, it probably did have a big impact on the activists, the people who are really at the forefront of some of these changes, the opposition movements and the network organizers, but we can't say that in itself it penetrated so widely throughout all societies that it was really the driver, as some journalists have started to, started to claim. But of course, even when we know that people are using Twitter and Facebook, we still don't know about its impact. We still have to say, did it actually help make people protest, encourage people to be active? But what I can do is look at a bit of broader evidence for that. And we can turn to some worldwide surveys where we've asked people what type of media they use and then about their attitudes and about their activities. And I'm going to just show you a little bit here from the worldwide survey evidence, the World Value Survey conducted in the fifth wave, 2005 to 2007. These are all the countries, and you can see that the World Value Survey, which is led by Ron Inglehart and his team, is really uh, the biggest survey in the world. It's now covering about 99 countries, uh, with about 90% of the world's population. There are still some countries which are, our coverage isn't as good as it should be, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see, is a major area that needs to be expanded. But nevertheless, over successive waves, and it's been going on since 1981, and the sixth wave is now in the field in 2010, many countries have now been uh, available, and I'm going to focus on uh, the survey which was done in 2005 to 2007. Now, for the very first time in this survey, I persuaded them to include some aspects of media use. There's a whole wide range of different values which are always monitored in the World Value Survey. Not just politics, but all sorts of other social values. For example, attitudes towards women, uh, the role of religion, uh, how far people are in favor of environmental protection and so on. But also, if we can include the media, we can start to see how far the internet access has an impact on a wide range of other values and in countries around the world where we've never had survey data on this before. In countries like Mali, in countries like Ghana, we can go and really make broad comparisons. So this is the, the uh, scale of media use that was put in. And what we can therefore do is compare whether or not people who say they use the internet or email as a source to find out what's going on in their country and the world, compared with those who used last week a newspaper, uh, television, or a variety of other things such as personal communications. Now this measure, I should add, is limited. It doesn't tell us what people were doing. It doesn't tell us whether they were using specific types of social media. And quite simply, in a, in a worldwide survey, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. But it's a proxy. If people were using the internet and email for some information about the event around their world, then, it, then we might assume that that might have some sort of impact. And we want to see whether the people who use the internet differ from those who use traditional media, like newspapers, or those who use television and radio. And here are my measures of um, democratic aspirations, democratic satisfaction, and democratic deficits, just like I said at the beginning. So we've asked people around the world about how far they want to have their own country to be democratic. How important is it for you to live in a country that is governed democratically? One to ten scale, we don't define democracy, we don't say what, what it means, we let people interpret it, but it's quite simply your aspirations that you want to be governed democratically. And then we also ask them their satisfaction. So we want to know whether or not they're happy with the way things are working, and how democratically is this country being governed today? And again, this is being asked all the way from Sweden through to uh, South Africa, from uh, Guatemala through to Australia. And then the deficit is simply the gap between the two. So if you have a small gap, we assume that, that basically people are fairly happy because they want a certain level of democracy and, and that's how they see the world. A big gap, I'm predicting, is going to lead to protest politics, and a variety of other types of acts which might uh, destabilize the government. And here, and I know you're going to hate this, but I have to give you one regression for all of the scholars in the world. I, by the way, threw out lots of regressions. I <laughs> had many more, but anyway, I just put in one. So what does this tell us? Well, quite simply, what we've got here is three columns. This is the, the question about how, how far do you want to have democracy in your country? <coughs> this is the question, how satisfied are you and this is the gap between the two. And internet users, along with other media users, we know are atypical. 
They're younger, they're better educated, they're more affluent. So we have to control for a number of things, and all of those could be expected to influence your attitudes. So the models do control for your age, they control for your income, and a variety of other factors. Uh, and by the way, for those who are interested in the technicality, this is a multi-level model. All the variables have been standardized, meaning we can compare each of these beta coefficients one against another. What does it show? Quite simply, and I'm only going to focus on this uh, per se. So those who use newspapers to find out about their country and the world find that they have higher democratic aspirations. They want more democracy. They are demanding it in their own country. Those who use television and radio news are also more demanding of democracy, and those who use the internet are also more demanding. What's going on there? Well, for me, it's just about diffusion. As we all know, many countries, if they can see uh, levels of uh, how democracy works in other countries, uh, want to aspire to those sets of values for themselves. It's an international diffusion which has gone on worldwide, and levels of democratic aspirations worldwide are enormous, about 8 out of 10. Even in unexpected countries, even in countries which don't have a strong democratic tradition, people still say, through a variety of measures, we want to be democratic. Now, what they mean by that is another question, and I'm happy to go into that. It's somewhat more complicated, but people say they want democracy. And using the media increases that aspiration, even when I've controlled for people's education, income, and age. What about their satisfaction? Well, as you can see, using a newspaper doesn't make a significant impact one way or the other. <laughs> You're neither more happy nor less happy. Using television makes you more happy with the way that democracy works in your country. Now, why is that? <laughs> well, we all know who owns the television stations and radio stations in many places. And uh, we're talking, by the way, about a Berlusconi in Italy, as well as some situations in a number of other countries which are less free than Italy. And it seems that you become happier with the way democracy works the more that you watch it on existing channels of television. But internet users, what we find very interestingly is that when I've controlled for all the other characteristics of who goes online, are more critical. They're more critical of how democracy works in their own country than those who use television and so on. And that means they have a, a, a gap. Well, all the, all the, all the um, groups have a gap, but essentially the internet users have the highest gap between their aspirations and their satisfaction. Now, I won't go into more detail about the implications, but you can always find uh, my book, Democratic Deficits. And what I show in that is essentially that those who have this gap in their aspirations are more likely to protest. They are less likely to comply with the law, to obey, um, to obey the law, to give taxes and a variety of other mechanisms. And at societal level, where you get a larger gap, this does contribute towards processes of democratization, even when I control for lots of other factors as well. So what's the conclusions? What's the overall patterns which we find? Well, first we have to say all of this is work in progress. The events are unfolding. We don't know what's going to happen in Bahrain. We don't know what's going to happen in Syria. Some of the governments are clearly being destabilized. The states are under real challenge. Whether or not they succeed through either repression or through uh, providing better services and, and trying to get more support, obviously remains to be seen. And we really still don't know what happened in Egypt and Libya and so on, because again, uh, area studies and other research needs to be done in great depth to understand what was really mo mobilizing people, what really drove those changes, radical changes, in very different ways. That being said, we can also conclude more positively that the role, I think, of social media in this process may be exaggerated simply because of the levels of penetration. Now, levels of access don't necessarily equate to impact. You can have a very small number of people with access, and yet it has an enormous impact through secondary usage. But nevertheless, the idea that this was a Twitter revolution or a Facebook revolution seems somewhat implausible to me. Uh, this, this media played a role, but it wasn't the driving determinants of all of these changes. And it seems very much, by the way, an American interpretation of what was going on, mainly by journalists sitting at home twittering each other, probably, 
Um, but yet we don't have a lot of good evidence for that. There is some evidence that the use of social media may activate the active, and that was more or less what I said in my democratic, uh, um, in my um, in my digital divide book years ago, which is that for some people it's really important, it's vital, it's the way that you organise. But for many other people, these media pass them by, particularly if they're not already engaged in these processes. But the evidence worldwide, in many countries, in countries which are developing, in countries in Africa, in, in countries in Latin America, in countries in Central and Eastern Europe, suggests that there is some pattern of internet users which makes them less satisfied with the way things are working in their own country. And therefore, that itself is more positive evidence that the larger democratic deficits has consequences for mobilizing protest. And the characteristics of internet users does make them different to the characteristics of the users of many other forms of traditional, traditional media. And with that, I very much look forward to hearing the comments of our panel and reactions and thoughts and the comments from the floor about whether you think social media was really critical for the events of the Arab Spring or whether you think it's probably been exaggerated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to call our panel to take their seats to the uh, uh, table. I'll very briefly introduce them uh, as uh, there will be uh, Michael, Gross, uh, Michael Cross from United Kingdom as a journalist and also open data activist. Uh, uh, also, Norbert Kersting from German uh, Münster University, uh, Department of Political Science. Uh, Heather Kaschner from National Democratic Institute, Uganda. And uh, uh, Professor Tad Hall from University of Utah. And I'm uh, now going to give floor to them for brief comments and reflections on what they think uh, were the key issues uh, about uh, uh, Pippa Norris's talk and uh, we're going to later open the floor for comments and questions so you can address the comments <coughs> to, to either Pippa Norris or to the, any of the panellists. So I will give floor to Michael first. Thanks. Um, well, what can I say about uh, democratic deficits? Um, I was, I'm speaking very much for, from a UK press perspective, and here it can be argued that maybe the, the UK media don't have very much of a gap between what people want from the media and what they, what they get, because uh, in the UK the media has always been the uh, held in very low esteem in popular opinion <laughs> and uh, recent events concerning various criminal investigations by some of our biggest selling newspapers uh, which are going to end up with a number of uh, my colleagues uh, are going to do jail time uh, including one or two quite well-known editors uh, this has tended to confirm uh, suspicions so the, the the media certainly in the UK are heading for a crisis. Um, the interesting uh, distinction in, in the research between the uh, users of uh, internet, new electronic media, and the traditional media, um, I, w I wonder how, to what extent that will hold up in, uh, in the future as, as there's more convergence mm. between the different patterns. What we're seeing, certainly in the UK, uh, in the probably the two the two main traditional media outlets that I work for, the Guardian and the Telegraph, both are in a state of obviously in a state of panic. Everyone's in a state of panic about the challenge from uh, the, the informal electronic media. Uh, the Guardian is losing something like 30 million euros a year, uh, and uh, really, all these so-called serious newspapers are in, are in that problem. One of the responses has been to embrace some of the tricks of the new media to get into doing more, uh, uh, of, of obviously, uh, opening up your, com your content for comments uh, on the web, and also for uh, encouraging more 
users to contribute on the web, user-generated websites, which the cynics will say is a way of doing things cheaper, but also a desperate attempt to engage with, with, with new readers. And also, I'm sad to say, uh, using Facebook and social media as a, as a means of reporting, as a, finding out facts, rather than sending reporters expensively out on the ground, as, as I used to do when I started out. So that's, that's the position. Um, I fear that the, 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 the state of the traditional media is actually going to get lower in uh, public esteem, and whether this is good for the democratic deficit in a developed uh, advanced democracy remains to be seen. I was invited a year ago, actually in May 2010, to the one of the, it actually it was the biggest um, e-government e conference in the Arab world. And it was, I was invited for e-democracy. And I said, okay, some of the countries are seen as authoritarian regimes. Some are in the Arab world, some are uh, what they call electoral democracy, not really well-functioning democracy. And I think, and at that point, I made a presentation similar to you, Pippa. I said, before you use the internet for e-democratization, you need more a proliferation of the internet. And we had the data with 8% or 6% in Libya, and and the same in other countries. So. I said that is the biggest obstacle when it comes to e-democracy, that there is no internet. Uh, anyway, uh, I think it is a really an artifact, and you are definitely right because of this proliferation. Mm -hmm. It's probably a journalist artifact, and there are other reasons for that. You see, um, when it comes to the, um, to, the, to the Facebook sites, and when it comes to the internet, you realize that most of these sites are, not, are in English and not in Arabic. I mean, that is for, what's for me a convincing argument as well. Yeah. Um, it is focusing more to the rest of the world and communicating there and yeah. not so much inside. Anyway, I think Africa is the first post-PC continent. I mean, they focus on other, other instruments, not so much the PC, but cell phones. And you have a very high cell phone proliferation. And that was used also to mobilize a kind of critical mass that is important in the different Arabic countries. And they could use other instruments like cell phones, etc., to bring all these people to Raria Place, and etc. I think that is a very important aspect. What we have nowadays for social mobilization, I think we have, um, and that is a trend worldwide. I wrote an article that you have um, to find instruments um, what I call between the brick and the ballot. You have electoral democracies using the ballot, but the people are not longer satisfied. Democratic deficits are there. There is a big democratic demand. What you realize is as a response you have in the Arabic countries, but also in the uh, old democracies, you have social protests. And I think we should use the e-democracy and the internet and other ways of political participation to channel that protest and to find ways between brick and ballot. I think that is a big demand for the future. Mm -hmm. And we should really develop instruments which can, can channel that and bring participation back on a non-violent protest. So, um I'm not an academic, so I don't have any regressions. <laughs> but um, what I do have are some observations from our work in Uganda, specifically using technology. And one of the things that we have observed, both in our work around elections and our work with parliament, is that if I'm an A student, I'm not, or if I'm a C student, student I should say, I'm not going to become an A student by using technology. The whole grading system does, though, shift upward. So if I'm an A activist already, using technology yep. makes me a better activist. If I'm a C activist, I'm still a C activist, but it makes me better at it. So for those of you who don't know the grading system and that I grew up with, that may not be very clear. But <laughs> the bottom line is that 
if I'm in the system and I'm eager and I'm ready to participate, <coughs> I'm going to use all of the tools available to me and try and exploit them in different ways, mm -hmm. and my performance is going to get better. But the availability of technology isn't necessarily revolutionizing my performance and my level of activism. Um, so that's one thing that we're observing. But we're also observing um, that the Arab Spring was inspirational for sub-Saharan Africa, but the obsession about the role in technology of, of technology is somehow distracting people from the types of organizing methodologies that are more accessible to them. I mean, there's a democratic deficit of fairly significant proportions in Uganda. But um, young, and young people are more and more and more stepping into the breach and trying to find ways to organize themselves. And a lot of development partners are also very fixated on this idea of technology. NDI is one of them. Yeah. But we all have to recognize that it can't be the the heart of what we do in a country like Uganda. The infrastructure is not available, the users aren't available, and if we get so distracted by the bright shiny object in the room, then we're going to, f we're, we're going to miss the opportunity. That being said, and this is a question that I have, I don't know if you've looked at this, Pippa, um, it's been suggested in a place like Uganda one of the opportunities that social media created was because the government was not really monitoring at the beginning right. social right. media, users were able to do things in ways that they weren't able to use their cell phones and they weren't able to use other organizing methodologies historically. And that initial, that initial rush created an opportunity that now in subsequent countries doesn't exist right. because the government is monitoring, except for, of course, the UK just got a little surprised, but I don't know how much <laughs> social media is really a part of that. Um, but I, I mean, I do think that those are things that um, are worth exploring in terms of the role of social media in the Arab Spring. How did the presentation of those tools open up an opportunity? And how now China totally realizes, and they're looking at, with like a hawk at everything. Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. The lesson has been learned both ways, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah we are, we're, and all of our governments are. I mean, it's sort of, I, uh, I was shocked, actually, when David Cameron went and suggested that they needed to have conversations about the role of social media yes, and implied limiting yeah, the, right. that how social media would play a role in the evolution of, of politics in the UK. For, for us sitting in Uganda trying to promote the aspiration of freedom and using technology for openness, and the UK is supposed to be a leader in that, right. now to hear the Prime Minister of the UK stepping back, it, it, was, um, it was not a good moment for <laughs> democratic <laughs> activists. <laughs> Not a good moment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to combine two things of, of being an academic and an American. And um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about some American data. But I want to do a thought experiment for a moment, which is to suggest, what if we were talking about a Twitter revolution in America, say in the 2010 election? We're very lucky in America that we have an organization called the Pew um, Internet and Social Life Survey. So 2% of Americans used Twitter in the month before the 2010 election. 2%. 11% um, used social network sites to learn about voting. 8% um, of people used um, online, these are online people, these are not all Americans, these are just online Americans, mm -hmm. used the internet to find out about campaign information. 8% for uh, posting political content. So even in America, yeah. which we view as being this place that is this highly Twitter-friendly, Facebook-using, you know, we're talking about less than 10% of people mm -hmm. are using Twitter and Facebook. So the idea that there's this Twitter revolution right. is, if you did it in America, it would be preposterous. Mm -hmm. So let alone. But I do want to suggest uh, two uh, 
points that I think are very important, though. One is to pick up on Norbert, Norbert's point, which is that uh, Americans focus on the internet, they focus on computers, I, my, you know, iPads, things like that. But in you know, much of the world, it is the cell phone that is the key tool. And you know, no, there were no articles written about texting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the texting revolution. But I will guarantee you that more people came to events because of texting than they ever did because of you know, Twitter. Mm -hmm. The second thing, though, is that um, it's pretty clear that there are groups of activists, within, especially within Egypt, like the Muslim Brotherhood, who prior to 2011 had put together social media networks using wikis, using mm -hmm. Twitter. And if you think about it, you know, in this way, if I'm a, a person who works for the, you know, if I'm with a Muslim Brotherhood or a group like that and I want to have a protest, I can tweet 100 people and have them go door to door mm -hmm. or have them text people that they know. So I can use social media you know, to activate the active, as, 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 as Pippa would describe it, and really you know, generate a very broad group of people out there. And the last point I want to make is this. They did a survey last week in America about the most important new, uh, modes of people getting news um, on a weekly basis. The second most important way people get news is word of mouth. And so, you know, I want to suggest that, you know, word of mouth is very important. I mean, it's not something we talk about either, but, you know, clearly if I can activate, pe you know, a, a, one group of people and then spread information through word of mouth, it's a very important uh, mechanism for, you know, promoting these types of activities. Mm -hmm. Okay, before I open the floor, Pippa, maybe you want to comment a little bit uh, to take up some of those points, or I can f open, open the floor open to the question. Floor, okay, so there are... Uh, already a number of hands up. I'm going to start from here and move backwards so uh, that wing has to wait a little bit. But uh, <laughs> uh, My name is Wojciech Celary and I come from Poland. And I like to remind you a story which is only 30 years old, means very young. We made a, a kind of revolution by solidarity in the 80s. Mm. Twitter didn't exist, yeah. Facebook yeah, yeah, didn't yeah. exist, Absolutely. penetration on internet was only in academic uh, centers. Right. Well, there was no cell phones. Can you imagine a world without cell phones? <laughs> <laughs> and penetration of, uh, of fixed line phones was very, very small. And we make a revolution without any of this social media, which liberated uh, 100 million people as a consequence of this, uh, of this movement. So I want to say that it is absolutely exaggerated that without Twitter and Facebook, people cannot go for democratic processes and fight with corrupted power and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. The second comment that I like to say is the following. Uh, you, you, have presented, uh, you have presented television as a media which is uh, generally people watching television which are relatively positive and making internet which are relatively negative. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, in all televisions there is a kind of a success propaganda. Well, so uh, it is in hands or more or less uh, people related with the government and government always say about itself good things and not bad things. Well, so... <laughs> If you are watching only this kind of things, you say, okay, if they say everybody, because they have one channel of information, so they say everybody thinks it is good, it must be good. Well, but uh, in the internet, it is opposite. If you compare the number of negative opinions to positive opinions, so positive opinions are almost inexistent. <laughs> They come as a perverse uh, effect of opposition to a negative opinion. So double negative becomes positive, but it's, <laughs> okay? it's like that. So I don't think that uh, people are more criticized this uh, gap and, and in between uh, well, uh, aspiration and, and satisfaction from democracy is something particular because if you take uh, any kind of a subject, the dissatisfaction in the internet is uh, always high. Mm -hmm. People keep positive uh, opinion for themselves and they express negative opinion. Well, that's a, a well-known phenomenon on the internet. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. <laughs> uh, Okay, thanks. Um, Jeremy Millard from Danish Technological Institute. I agree uh, very much with what's just been said, of course, and 
Uh, and of course, there's been protests and, and revolutions throughout history. Right. But I think there is, there is a ch maybe a change of pace and a change of, of impact and a change of uh, yeah, uh, outreach w with the new technology. But just a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned the difference between TV and Internet. If you recall the, what happened in Tunisia, which started all this, it wasn't oh. Facebook or Twitter. What happened was that the guy died in some dusty <laughs> provincial town somewhere. No one really noticed. But his mother, a few days later, made a protest outside the town hall. Mm -hmm. His cousin, I think it was, mm. uh, filmed it on his mobile phone, put it up on Facebook. But that wasn't it. It was then captured by Al Jazeera who broadcast it across the Arab yes. world. And that's yes. what started the mm. snowballing effect. And the, it went viral, and many other protests took place. Yes. So it was this I interesting combination between the new media and the traditional media. I, I know traditional media, as you just said, tends to be more conservative and, and supporting the status quo. Maybe Al Jazeera is a little bit different. I'm not sure. They also have a, an axe to grind, of course. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. And, and, and I think it was Michael or somebody who mentioned the merging of the, yeah. the old and new technology was, 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 quite, was, was interesting in this context. I, th I think we need to do a bit more research maybe into that. And um, uh, the other thing about the mo mobile phone or texting not being very important. If you look at the London riots, it was actually, it wasn't Facebook or Twitter which we used to comment. It was actually uh, young kids, that right. sort of underclass, if I, would, if I want to call them that, using uh, messaging services on, um, on Blackberry, Blackberry which actually was extremely yeah. important for coordination. So there was a very, very good example of, of, of the use of that tool, particularly for in that particular context. The final comment is, uh, which uh, just reflecting what, um, sorry, the guest from Utah said, uh, that it was quite interesting that you know David Cameron and, and also politicians in the U.S. were heavily criticising you know Iran and Egypt for turning off networks. Sorry, it was it was Heather who said who mentioned this, but then of course we had the, we had the Bart shooting in San Francisco back in in July or yeah. August. Mm -hmm where the mobile network was uh, turned off yeah. and David Cameron was threatening to do the same thing, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't actually do it. Uh, and of course the same politicians who are criticizing governments in other countries, yes. then their first knee-jerk reaction right. is to do the same. Yeah. They panic and they, get in, they want to get into a control mode. So that's also a very interesting phenomenon, I think, which we need, we need to look at. So, mm -hmm. so certainly the new media are shaking these things up a bit and mm -hmm. I think that's uh, extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take one more comment and then we're going to let the panel to respond a little bit. Uh, Mahmoud Ambar from uh, UNDP office, Syria, working on e-government. So I, I would like to agree with the finding of uh, your research regarding that really Facebook and Twitter are used uh, uh, for the activists in general, not for the traditional people. Most of the people are, are using the traditional media and following it. But I need also to comment on the the issue of the, the media uh, in general. Because uh, the, the activists are empowered now, they have the source of information, but the new media are not used adequately by the media channels. That means they are relying on the, the activists to get the information. Mm -hmm. And this is basically, uh, uh, in, if we look to the good governance model, you have the activists, the civil society, mm -hmm. and you have the media, and you have other uh, institutions. Uh, I think with this process, we need to find a way to ensure that uh, activists are not really used a pro as a proxy by the media. That means they are uh, uh, filtering the information as the way they want to look at it. And we need to ensure that the media is really neutral and uh, not uh, biased in this new model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Kai, do you want to comment, any of you? Or shall we take more questions from the floor? Okay, there is one over here. Thank you very much. Hello. Does it work? Mm. It does. It's on. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Yuri Misnikov from uh, uh, Institute of Communication Studies, Lutz University, and actually happen to be a former UNDP staff member, too. Yes. Uh, I, I very much like the presentation, about, uh, in particular that model regarding supply and demand. And uh, of course, we know that. Uh, supply is actually uh, quite limited, but the problem is that it's always very difficult to predict where it, 
all calms and revolution happens. We could not predict the Soviet Union collapse. We could not predict the Berlin Wall. We could not predict uh, Serbia. We could not predict uh, all other revolutions. I think this is a problem that probably requires special attention. That's something we don't uh, study well. And I would agree that, of course, uh, it's not a Twitter revolution. Uh, we, we can go back to Moldova, which was probably dubbed first time Twitter revolution. Uh, it's much more complex, certainly. But, uh, and different media are used extensively. Either it would be offline media or word of mouth, whatever. But of course there is a fundamental problem. If you <coughs> look at fundamental research uh, like the media system of, of Mancini, Hani, we, we don't see that this any sort of mention of electronic media is kind of standard approach of newspapers, TV. And that's changing. And of course internet users should not be taken out from the context. They're still citizens. They use all kind of media and we probably should talk about kind of media ecology, kind of more integrating approach and, and shifting this focus from uh, simply uh, sort of talking about technology as an enabler in my view and, and moving towards a more kind of co-constituting approach when it's actually constructed socially so it's not just technology taken from the moon and, and brought here it, it's, it's they influence each other as they co-constitute each other. I think this is fundamental change which is happening and more research I agree with Jeremy that probably would require it. For example, if people go out, definitely we know from the research and people's your research that this is activists became more active. But what is happening before activists come out, probably there is some sort of socialization preceding those and these are not very active people who become active at some point, active enough to protest and, and, and sort of put their life under threat, actually. I mean, this is quite, quite serious. So this is uh, something which we have to look what's happening before that, what kind of forms of socialization is happening before that. And going back to Tunisia, we should also f not forget that uh, the, that person who, a young jobless person who set him fire, he was IT specialist who could not find a job. I mean, this is also, and probably revolutions happen exactly in those countries which have low penetration rate. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, there is another comment over there. Um, I'm Christina Mann from Policy Studies Center Praxis. And um, two brief comments, more like stories. Um, about a year and a half ago, I traveled extensively in Libya and Egypt and, and Syria and Jordan. And I would say that everything was in the air that this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, the, what, what I'm saying this is that when I was there and I talked to local folks and I saw how you know, folks living in Petra could have access to all kind of technology there, or folks in villages in Libya knew immediately what kind of country Estonia was or South Africa, which is my other home, is. So the information was there right away. So I would say that the availability of social media to the folks has not maybe been the main driver in the process, but has definitely built up the demand for such a change in the society. Okay? So I think that's definitely very, very important. And and, um, um, you know, combining the modern technology and, and kind of traditional technology, one of the reasons why people say that Estonia is more um, successful in several ways than its neighboring countries who came out from the Soviet past was access to the Finnish television. Mm -hmm. So we, ha we knew yes. what the outside world was like. And I would think that the same has happened in Libya, Egypt, and, and Tunisia, and, and all those countries. People knew what the other option was going to be. Mm -hmm. And the other is my comment about... Um, using cell phones and the timing issue and then also that kind of word by mouth process. I live in South Africa and um, I remember how, um, you know, which is a democratic and developed country, but um, not everybody in the villages have access to internet, right. but everybody has extremely cheap cell phones. So cell phones are used for social services, you know, HIV counseling and so on, but also for policy making, for protesting, for expressing your opinions. And um, about two years ago, when we were preparing for World Cup in Polokwane, um, employees who were building the soccer stadiums were not getting paid. So immediately, two or three 
three people um, put together an activist plan how to, um, you know, in one day or two days protest against uh, the non-payments. They texted it to about 100 or 300 or 400 people and suddenly 2,000 people were in Polokwane or in all the neighboring, uh, neighboring areas, not Joburg, but, you know, from the north, mm -hmm. came together. And, the, and those who didn't get information through cell phones, that was spread by word by mouth. So, you know, a week after that, I went to the very remote villages in, um, in Kalahari, and I spoke to a few Bushmen who already knew about this, okay? And they don't have television, and they don't have internet, but they already knew about this. So what I'm just saying is that it's not the main driving force, but the speed that those tools um, allow us to use is, I think, just um, obnoxious in many, many ways, in a positive way as well. Thank you. Okay, there are two comments over here and then a few in the back. Uh. <coughs> uh, this, is this is Vasily from uh, gov to you. I wanted to pick up uh, from what Yuri and, uh, and Jeremy said and, into, and bring it into perspective into a very interesting example. Um, I come from Greece. Uh, and uh, I live in Belgium, so we saw a lot of data <laughs> flying from, uh, from actually uh, from Madrid when they had, their, when the, when they had a uh, demonstration. And they put a very big um, uh, banner that said, Greece, wake up. Mm. And uh, between the, t the, the tweets and the Facebook and the pages, the Greeks woke up and, and they, cre they just generated... A, uh, a mass amount of them. I mean, I'm sure all of you have heard about this. And, um, and we had, in between the demonstrations, whenever the police would come over and so on, their tweets uh, where they say where they stand, where they can go. So they also uh, control via texting and tweets the crowds in the demonstration. So you have real life yes. uh, movement of information. Now, the media has played a very interesting role, and I do not really want to, to get into this, uh, because uh, uh, there is also the opposition media, and uh, they're the media that, uh, uh, that is also uh, promotes uh, the governmental activities. So, but this was real life. I mean, uh, you could see what is going on, and, and in fact, some of the Facebook uh, uh, pages uh, they were competing in numbers between the Spaniards and, of course, the Greeks said, friends, wake up. So we will see uh, what happens. The story is not over yet on that one. Okay, thank you. There's just a comment next to you as well. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I just want, uh, my name is Stephen. I'm uh, originally from Belgium. I live in Estonia. My mother tongue is Dutch but I also speak English, French, and I understand German and a tiny bit of Estonia, Estonian, and it ties into my question. Um, aren't we missing a whole lot by the language thing? If I uh, listen in the morning to the news on uh, Deutsche Welle on the radio, I hear completely different things than if I listen to BBC World Services or come home and read my Belgian newspaper online or uh, in the evening ask my uh, girlfriend what was on the Estonian news, or even more simple, look at the, the English language Estonian news channel, which then focus on, focuses on completely different things. Um, so I, I really have the idea that we are actually missing a whole lot by the language uh, issue. And um, I, I, I please don't take it as criticism, but I'm, I'm wondering how much of that can you, can you compensate by, by research, field research, <laughs> literature research, desk, desk research, um, where's the mix there? What can you do to make this you know, more, more comprehensive? Let's put it that way. Thank you. I think as, uh, as the story goes, about more than half of the tweets about Arab Spring uh, and around the area were in English. So the question goes uh, very relevant. And I would like now to give a panel of a brief word to respond to that issue. And then we'll take the next, uh, next speakers from the floor. Well, let's, let's put a couple of points. I think these comments have been incredibly useful and very salutary <clears throat> to think about Poland and all the other countries which have gone through revolutions before all of these events happened. Of course, there were always still radical forms of communication, Samistat literature and, and a variety of other methods. Uh, so there were forms of communication, but not the new ones. 
And really, we know that the internet basically collapses space and time. So it both creates a less distance, whether it's in South Africa and you're learning about what's happening in, in Syria or your, your neighbors uh, in terms of democratization and change. And it in expands the pace of change as well. So again, we can get things done instantly rather than done on a slow pace. But for me, the interesting question is partly whether the governments and the groups who are mobilizing through these methods are equally adept and nimble at using this. And for example, in terms of the British-UK riots, what seems to happen is that the rioters were all savvy, they were all young, they knew exactly how to Blackberry and text each other. The police were asleep. The politicians, by the way, were all on their holidays. <laughs> it was August, and so they were away in the um, Dordogne or wherever they go nowadays. <laughs> and, and it seems like, um, in fact, in that particular case, although the riots were very negative in all sorts of regards, um, there wasn't an equal balance of force. But the police themselves can, of course, also learn and adapt and then use these technologies themselves to control the crowd as much as the crowd can use it to try and play cat and mouse and avoid the police. So where there's a level playing field and both sides have got access, then we can see that there's less impact for the protest movements. Where the protesters are in advance, that's where you're going to see a more radical change uh, being produced by these new media. And the second point I just wanted to make, and again, so many good points, but just on the normative issues about whether or not the social media are now being used by the old media. I think it's absolutely true that there is a number of instances now where you can see that if it's being caught by social media, for example, a, U a YouTube video, then the um, traditional media, television and newspapers, are now reporting it as fact. In other words, as Michael, I think, said, they're not, journalists are not necessarily fact-checking. They're not necessarily looking at the sources critically, particularly if it's a vivid image then, you know, Lise Doucette on the BBC will say, well, there's no real evidence of, for example, human rights abuses in Syria. Ah, we've just had this video. It must be true. Um, but we all know life is far more complex than that. And I think it really does basically create normative issues about what is the role of a journalist nowadays and how is that changing in response to these new technologies. And do they still have an independent um, role in, in evaluating evidence and critically thinking about the different forms of evidence, or are they simply a conduit, whether it's because it's cheap or for me probably because it's fast and it's easy. I think that's as important. Um, so what is a journalist nowadays versus uh, a citizen journalist? Uh, and those are big issues, I think. Mm. Okay. You want to take up on that can point? I, can I, I, I just um, recall another revolution where, which I happened to uh, witness. There was, this was in uh, Iran in uh, 79, where the key technology, the enabling technology there, was the C60 cassette tape. The first time I heard uh, Khomeini's words was on a cassette being played in the, in the bazaar. There, 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 of course, the language issue didn't arise because it was perfectly adaptable to whichever language it was uh, recorded in. Um, another just quick observation. I don't know if anyone was watching Twitter yesterday afternoon, but one of the trending names was that of a very obscure... UK Labour Party opposition politician. Why was this trending on this global, so-called global medium, inclusive medium? Because he'd made, as an obscure Labour Party uh, opposition conference, he'd made a call for journalism to be regulated in the UK. It just shows the, the observation that yeah. Twitter and the traditional media are in a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to repeat it, but I think the media, the new media plays an important role when it comes to the engagement of a small group of multiplicators. And yes, I think that's important for a social mobilization. But in this field of social mobilization, also in the field of political participation and of uh, information, I think we have to go into a direction which, uh, which I call blended democracy. We have to mix the analog and the, and the um, digital. We have to mix the virtual and the real participation. And in that regard, we also may come to, a, to one, in, into one um, field which is very critical when it comes to the internet and news. You see, what you mentioned, if it's really true that there are only non-positive messages in the internet, <laughs> and what is the quality of it? What is the quality of information? I think in the long run, we have to discuss about certain standards. The printed media always had a kind of ethics in that field. I mean, they were gatekeepers, they were controlling media, but they <coughs> also had certain ethics. 
And in the internet, I have sometimes the impression, because of the um, fragmentation of the, of the internet, uh, this kind of quality standards are going down. And um, people are expressing themselves, but they are not uh, looking for the common wealth. And um, maybe, I don't know, I have a solution for that, but I think we have to go into a kind of standardization, quality control, checks and balances of the, of the big interesting <laughs> focus who was, was seen to be a guardian. The internet and media are seen as a guardian, but I think we have to find a guardian for the guardian as well. Absolutely not. <laughs> the, the, the two are indivisible. In the, uh, to, I quote uh, a British uh, playwright, Tom Stoppard, the, uh, the, the existence of the junk press is the sign of a society that has got one thing right, that no one has the responsibility to decide <laughs> where responsible press begins. You cannot have uh, the quality unless you also have the junk. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that from somebody on the Guardian. So. <laughs> mm. um, that being said, I think that there is a good debate, and y you raise an interesting point about language. I think there is a good debate that's starting to emerge about whether or not the internet is making us dumber. Um, and I think it's it's a useful debate in this context of democracy because the discussion about filtering and the way in which our interests bring about the kinds of content that we receive and how it shapes us also shapes our ability to participate in in different ways. I mean, for some of us who are interested in a wide variety of things and express that in our internet behavior, maybe the filtering becomes less. But for internet users who are just online for a very narrow set of things, the information opportunity isn't there. It actually becomes less and less and less. And so um, the challenge for activists who are trying to engage people online is how do you break through the how do you break through the sort of filters that people have set up um, so that you can engage them and this is a challenge for government too a lot of the systems that we're building top down to try and engage citizens you know what brings them what brings them into your platform and and how do you penetrate there's a great discussion that we've been having in some of our programs about whether or not we build applications around platforms like Facebook where internet users already exist or we build new types of things and try and drag them drag them over it, it's an interesting discussion but I, I think um, these are things that we need to look at from the citizen perspective about how we can engage people who are using the internet to sort of block out things that they don't really want to hear mm -hmm. and for government as well. So what I'd like to do is actually ask Michael a question with, and which is to take some of the comments that were made earlier about, you know, the um, things trending on Twitter and, you know, Twitter played a key role potentially in the Arab Spring because reporters were tracking things on Twitter because they couldn't get out of their hotels or whatever. And the new media is changing the way reporters report. They have to report multiple stories in a day. They're not just working on one story. So could you just talk a little bit about whether or not you think the social media is changing the work of a journalist and actually making it potentially worse because journalists are using shortcuts and they're getting information from just activists who are online as opposed to the reporting about what the broader public in somewhere like Egypt or Tunisia think? I don't, I don't think there's, a, there's any doubt about that. Um, uh, Syria has a, there's a special problem there at the moment in, the, in that uh, foreign journalists aren't uh, given access. Um, I, I, I don't think there's anything to, anything to argue about. I mean, uh, it, as, as little as... God, well, I say a little as 30 years ago, I was uh, working for a, a weekly news magazine. I was more or less free to wander around Ethiopia, filing one piece every couple of weeks and disappearing for quite, quite a, a month at a time while still drawing my salary. I tell that to my younger colleagues now. That's uh, science fiction they're expected to <laughs> produce. Yeah. Uh, uh, copy really a uh, rolling news copy f around uh, around the world uh, around the the clock. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the floor back because there are many eager hands up and uh, really many people wanting to comment. So there is one person who already has a microphone, so he can start, and then we move move on this row backwards. People at the back. Yes, hi. <coughs> well, I had a comment uh, on the previous discussion. Uh, my name is Gianluca Misuraka. I'm from the European Commission. I think uh, one of my previous life, I was uh, working with the UN. Uh, in the MENA region. Mm -hmm. So having lived and worked in uh, some of the countries uh, now are in this Arab Spring, uh, I can confirm what was said that, uh, I mean, it was in the air. It's not just because of Facebook and Twitter. And also, I mean, a bit of a concern about the fact that uh, we only look at Facebook and Twitter, and also the data, I mean, can be discussed. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I mean, there, is, there are other medias, other net, social networks that are used, especially because of the language. The Al Jazeera uh, television is playing a big role, etc. Uh, but I wanted to go back uh, to the fundamentals, to the, and having the pleasure of having Professor Norris here, so uh, the academic perspective you brought. Uh, I may be wrong, but maybe, or maybe it's a provocation, but looking at your model, it looks like... Uh, the more we reduce the digital divide, the more we may increase the democratic deficit. Mm -hmm. Can yep. you elaborate on that? Thanks. <laughs> While we move the microphone from one place to another, a very brief comment, or there is another person waiting? No, I mean, I agree. Um, <laughs> Milan Maric from Montenegro. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's all about information. Um, uh, we need information, and we have information that could be better than we'll use this information. So uh, all of us are curious more and uh, look where information could be found. Then internet users are looking to the internet as, as, a, as, a, as a, a very uh, rich source of information. So that's about what they expect more and that what, why, why they are critical more. But uh, uh, I think that uh, connecting with the social media and e-government is very important. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, it's on the government level how much governments uh, uh, they, they want to give uh, to people, to citizens. And if using social media, then they could use uh, uh, energy from the citizen, from the end user, to create a better government. And to uh, allow them to express their energy rather in an informatic way than on the street. Mm -hmm. So that, that's important in the uh, emerging countries, in developing countries, to leave more democracy to the people using a government. And uh, it's better to have the energy creative on social, social media and uh, change uh, uh, governance uh, before then they uh, uh, change themselves, a uh, government by themselves. That's my point. Okay, there have been hand, there's hands up behind there. <coughs> um, and right at the back there are some hands which you never get. Yeah, there are quite a few hands yeah. all over the place. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Gideon Litchfield from the UK. So being a journalist I want to very short, briefly try to answer a couple of the questions that were raised on the panel. The first is Michael Cross's question, what, do, what is a professional journalist in the role in the age of citizen journalists? And I want to suggest that it's someone, first of all, who does it full time, mm. and second, who um, acts as a kind of filter on the huge amount of information that comes from other media and from citizen journalists and from social media uh, and picks out bits that are relevant to a particular audience because we, we have to remember that journalists always work for an audience mm -hmm. uh, and uh, more and more they're getting to understand their audiences and, and what they want to know. So a professional journalist, I guess, is someone who, who does that kind of funneling. And that then relates to Heather's question about how do activists reach, uh, break, well, you said breakthrough to people who've set up filters. And I want to suggest that that's the wrong way to think about it. Um, because I think that uh, for activists, for journalists, for filmmakers, for book writers, for all sorts of people, increasingly it's about not trying to break through to the people who are indifferent to you, it's, mm -hmm. which has been always the old model of thinking. It's about identifying the people who are not indifferent. Um, finding, you know, using the internet as a way to identify the audience who is actually receptive to your messages. Uh, and I think that's kind of the central paradigm. That's a great point. Okay, yeah. there is a question right in the back. But that is not blocked from the beginning. You focus on your audience. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Perkins from the UN Regional Office in Beirut. 
And uh, I've been uh, sort of joking with my colleagues during this week about uh, people who uh, use the platform to make comments instead of asking questions. So I'll try to uh, excuse myself by at least being brief. Uh, there's been some questions raised about uh, linguistic issues and the difficulty of analyzing what's happening in social media in the region. I just wanted to plug the uh, 2 o'clock session in which we'll be specifically looking at some of those uh, components in the uh, social media session then. Uh, the question that I would have for the panel is that we've spent a good deal of uh, effort uh, debunking the original hypothesis that this was a social media driven revolution. But I think we also have a compelling glass half full question on what positive applications we can have with social media in e-governance and uh, e-democracy. So I would pose to the panel what applications you would see as being the most compelling in that realm. Thank you. Uh, but before I give panel the opportunity to answer, there are urgent hands in the back who still want to <laughs> have their five cents worth in. So. I'm Anil Rao from India. I have a comment to pass. It is ultimately the basic issue at the center of the social revolution which decides the effectivity of a particular type of media. If the issue is very near and dear to us, maybe freedom, maybe corruption, maybe democratic values, maybe eternal values or maybe extreme radical values, it is that particular media which is going to make an impact. And my presumption is that in that case, the type of media doesn't matter. It may be mouth publicity, mouth word, which will be effective. But ultimately, the whole effectivity depends on the issue at the heart of that particular uh, social revolution. OK, thank you. There is a comment right over there. Yeah, you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I am Ibrahim from Sudan. And I live in United Arab Emirates, so from the region. Um, I would like to agree with the finding of the uh, research, especially the, the comment on exaggerated role of social media. But I'd love to hear more comments on the policy maker side, the government side, on how to deal with social media. In 2009, uh, I used to observe the role of social media in the events in Iran following the elections. <coughs> and one interesting finding that um, the next day the government blocked uh, traditional media. The top search term in Google was Facebook. Um, so internet users didn't know that it's facebook.com and they use, they have to google it to find it. So it's difficult to say such people use it to organize a uh, protest. They needed it as an alternative source of information. So I'd like to hear your finding on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to close the floor for questions and give each of the panelists about half a minute worth of closing words because I know some of them have to rush for to catch their airplanes so we might start from that and move uh, up to this way. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that I think that uh, the, on the glass half full question I do think that it's very important to remember that you know when used by activists these social media can be highly effective and you know they're a great way of mobilizing people. The other thing though that the question about Iran brought up is that you should also remember that governments can use social media for very nefarious purposes. Right. And you know they took pictures of people that were posted on social media and then found those people mm -hmm. in Iran. So we should never forget that there are flip sides to all of these social media as well and they can be used for by the government to for oppression just as well as they can be used by people to promote freedom. But on the positive side, and uh, taking the point from our friends in, uh, from Montenegro, I, I think that there is a great opportunity. I think that all of us here are interested in investing in the opportunity of using social media to create a dialogue um, between government and the citizens. And the more that we can exploit the opportunity that social media presents, to bring people into contact with their representatives and give people a, ch a feeling of having a voice. Um, and this, though, requires, I think, special effort on the part of the government, not just to create the platform. It's not an if you build it, they will come sort of thing. Um, it, it's to be able to think through to the end, how am I going to respond? when people talk to me and I, I don't I think governments are s still haven't quite gripped that part of it if you're gonna have a conversation in order to avoid the democratic deficit growing 
through the use of social media, you have to be able to give something back at the end of the conversation. That's what people are expecting of you. So you're right. I think creating the dialogue is a, is a huge opportunity for government, but then government has to be ready to deliver in new ways. You see, the Internet is important in different things, that it's good in different things, so the new information and communication technologies, and it's bad in other. It's good when it comes to memory. A World Wide Web is a memory of organization was built for that, and it's good in that sense. It, and it's um, less good, that is my impression, when it comes to communication, because we did some research some 10 years ago uh, analyzing web forums, and what we realized, it was not this kind of Athens democracy with, with arguments and deliberation. It was more monologue, more hate speech. Remember, I mean, 10 years ago, people had to, to register and to identify to, to be part of that because there was so much hate speech in the web forums. And so um, I think it is problematic when it comes to communication. There, here, face-to-face -face communication is, a different, uh, is definitely better. But it is definitely good when it comes to social mobilization. Um, but maybe that is related to that. I mean, I have a problem if you really only try to communicate with those people who have identically the same opinion what you have. I mean, that you mentioned that from uh, that 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 is uh, the main the first idea to find other people to organize. Of course, that is important. But in the long run. You should, you should uh, have contact and uh, open also to other opinions and um, find a dialogue which is broader and which brings more different interest groups. I mean, we are all living in a society which is becoming more and more fragmented and I think this, there is more and more a need for more <coughs> inclusiveness of the different groups and not of small little entities who are not communicating to each other. That makes me feel nice and warm, but uh, I'm afraid the, <laughs> the history of commercial media is that is uh, commercial media that try to preach outside their audiences go bust, and they're kept going because a proprietor like a beaver brook or someone yeah. wants to <laughs> preach, but otherwise they go bust. Successful yeah. media organizations identify their target and go to them. And I, I just conclude by saying that basically ICTs reflect the organizational structure. They don't transform it. In other words, if you're in a government department and you're in a ministry and it's hierarchical and it's bureaucratic and decisions go upwards, not necessarily downwards, then that's how you're going to use the technology as a way of getting out your message. You might have published a booklet, now you put it online, but you're not really going to be able to adapt flexibly to the new social media for structural constraints. You can't put things up there which are critical of the ministry. You can't uh, decentralize to allow uh, bureaucrats to work uh, with, with social media. If you're a if you are a deconstructed organization, and that's exactly what a protest is, that's what opposition movements are, particularly in the region, then you're going to be able to use it perfectly because the new technologies are deconstructed media. And so again, it's about how you can think about these. And the organization is going to trump everything. The way that you are, are, are organized is going to basically determine all of these sorts of uses, not vice versa. So thank you, uh, everyone, for pitching in. We have a full day of conference and many of the sessions where we can well, take up the themes that we've been brought up in this panel. And thank you for the whole panel and the audience. Yeah. <laughs>